respect to life. Look what Jesus did. He took her by the hand and said, my child, get up. So it's also biblical to take the dead person by the hand and then give the command. Okay. Now, Peter raised Tabitha through two separate and distinct stages. Separate and distinct. Stage one was prayer to God on his knees. Now, during the prayer, did Tabitha come back to life? No. So what was the purpose of the prayer? To prepare Peter to raise her back to life. So prayer is important. Yes, very important. But it is not the prayer that results in the miracle. But prayer prepares you to move the mountain to perform the miracle. All right? Prayer is important, but it is not prayer itself which results in the miracle. It's what you do after you pray. So there were two stages. Prayer to God followed by a command to Tabitha. When did the miracle take place? Stage one or stage two? Stage two when he issued the command. So you see, the pattern is the same, right? The pattern is the same throughout. Which stage, during which stages the miracle took place? When he exercised authority by giving a command to Tabitha. Now you know how to raise the dead, correct? Do you know how to raise the dead now? Say yes. yes. That's the right answer, excellent. It's right there. Now, notice that Peter did not mix praying and commanding. First he prayed, and then he got up, and then he gave the command. He didn't mix the praying and commanding which is what we usually do, right? Okay, let me tell you what we usually do. Before you were trained, this is what you would do when you're ministering to the sick. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. That's prayer, right? Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, be healed. That's commanding, right? Then you pray. That's praying, right? And then you say, Father, in the name of Jesus, be healed. Okay? So you're going up and down and up and down, right? Okay? Priestly, kingly, priestly, kingly, priestly, kingly. That's what we normally do. We mix the priestly and the kingly, and sometimes we throw in prophetic as well, okay? We mix it together. Peter did not mix the priestly and the kingly. He kept them separate and distinct. First, the priestly on his knees, and then the kingly. Okay? Why did he not mix the two? What? happens to your authority when you mix the priestly and the kingly. I already shared this earlier. What happens to your authority? You dilute. When you mix the priestly and the kingly, it's like mixing hot water and cold water. You are diluting, compromising your authority, and that's why nothing happens when you mix the priestly and the kingly. Is that clear? Okay. Don't mix the two. Keep them separate. If you are not properly trained, you will inevitably mix the two, okay? Up and down and up and down. You're compromising, diluting your authority. Got that? So now you know what you're doing, okay? You can't go up and down, up and down and up and down and up. Come on, give me a break. Stop it. it makes no sense at all, okay? Now you're properly trained, now you know what you're doing. Got it? No mixing. You want to pray first? Go ahead, you pray first. How about Jesus? Remember when he raised Lazarus? Did he pray first? Yes, he did. He did pray first. But for whose sake did he pray? For the sake of the people there. So that they would know that it was the Father doing it through him. Okay? But after he prayed to the Father, then what did he do? Lazarus. Come forth. Did he mix the praying and the commanding? No, he kept them separate. Okay, look at it. It's in John, John 11. Right? Okay, you got that? Now, let me share with you this testimony.
I think I shared this, did I share this in your home? About the arena being raised back to life? Yes. I shared this yes. with someone recently. Yes. I, yes, you did. I, I did, okay. Let me share it with everyone, okay? In 2003, my wife and I went back to Indonesia and we trained a group of servants of God with this power and authority. And then one of them began to apply this power and authority and he began to win many Muslims. And these Muslims were from the Sunda tribe. The Sunda tribe consists of over 40 million gospel resistant Muslims living in West Java of Indonesia. They are very resistant to the gospel. If you go to them using traditional ways, they refuse the gospel. You go to them bringing food and rice, they say, no, thank you, they are resistant to the gospel. But when they saw the miracles, these Sunnidese Muslims turned to the Lord. Now he has about 5,000 born-again followers of Isa al-Masih, okay, in Indonesia. There was a young girl named Rina who was going to his meetings, all right? And uh, she was interested in the gospel. And then the servant of God, his name was Elijah. That's her father, by the way. Elijah would minister to her because she had some physical problems. So he would drive her and her dad to a Christian hospital two hours away in the big city. Okay, they lived in a village. And so he showed love for this family driving her back and forth to the hospital, and she would come to his meetings and listen to the gospel. But one day, she made a mistake. She married a Muslim man. And you know what happens when a woman marries a Muslim man. She automatically becomes a Muslim. So she stopped going to the meetings. She essentially denied Jesus. And at some point after that, she had a cancerous cyst develop in her womb. It was very serious. It was getting worse and worse and worse. For 10 days, she was lying on the floor. She could not eat, she could not drink. She was just slowly dying. Finally, her parents, in desperation, they took her back to the Christian hospital two hours away from the village, and the doctors examined her, and they said, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. She's going to die. So her family took her back to the village, and there, at around 5 p.m., one evening, she died. There were three mosques in that community, and they made an announcement that Rina had died, and that later that evening, they were going to bury her. Because according to Muslim custom, you have to bury them quite quickly, right? Okay. Now, so before the burial, however, uh, the Muslims, neighbors and friends, they gathered in Rina's home. They were sitting on the floor and they were praying to Allah for Allah to receive her spirit to paradise. Okay. I believe that's what Muslims do uh, as part of their custom when someone dies. Now, at about that time, when the Muslims were praying for Rina's spirit to be received to paradise, the servant of God who, who was ministering to her, his name was Elijah, he was in the big city, that's where he lives, two hours from the village, and he heard that Rina had died. And when he heard this news, he was very upset because he had spent so much time and effort ministering to this girl. And then she denied Jesus, and then she died. It means he wasted his time, because now she has no hope. He's wasted his time. And so when he heard that she died, he immediately went to the Lord and prayed. I don't know what he prayed, but it was like complaining to the Lord. Like, why, Lord? I ministered to her. I spent so much time and effort ministering to her, and now she's dead, and she... She denied you, Lord. Why? 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 He's complaining. After he finishes praying, he picks up his mobile phone and he calls up one of his leaders in the village where Rina lives. 
The name of this leader is Daset, and he's a, he's a, he's a Sundanese, former Muslim Sundanese. And Elijah says to Daset, Daset, I want you to take your wife to go see Rina, tell her to wake up and meet me here in the hospital. And Daset says, she's dead. She's dead. And Elijah goes, I know. You and your wife go to Rena's house, tell her to wake up and meet me here in the hospital. Oh, Dasep, completely confused, right? She's dead. What's the point? But Dasep, he was taught to obey. <laughs> obey his spiritual authority. And so Dasep says, OK, <laughs> we'll go. And so Dasep and his wife, they get on their motorcycle and uh, they motor to Rina's home. They knock on the door and they meet uh, her dad and her dad knows them. And they said, can we come in and pray for Rina? Oh, absolutely, come in. So they make their way into the room where all of the Muslims are seated on the floor. They're chanting to Allah, okay? Make their way through and Rina's body is in the middle of the room covered by a cloth. And then Dasep's wife, she's the one who does the ministry because Rina is a woman. So it's Dasep's wife. She approaches the body and she uncovers Rina's hand. And her hand is all wrinkled and cold. She's really, really dead, okay? All wrinkled up, just bone, skin and bones. So, Dasep's wife takes her by the hand, holds her hand, and then she makes her first mistake. She closes her eyes. She's holding Rina's hand. She closes her eyes and she says, Rina, wake up in the name of Jesus. Wake up. Wake up in the name of Jesus, Rina, and meet Pastor Elijah in the hospital. Suddenly, she felt something in her hand move. That's why you leave your eyes open when you raise the dead. You got that? You got that? Leave your eyes open. Watch what God does. Because if the person comes back to life, it might scare the daylights out of you. I'm just half joking. Okay? But half joking. So Rena's hand is moving. <laughs> and so they go, whoa. <laughs> so they uncover her, her head and her face. Yeah, her eyes are moving up and down, back. And finally her eyes settle down and Rina is awake. She's conscious. She is alive. So they say, okay, let's take her to the hospital and see Pastor Elijah. So they took her back to the hospital two hours away, but now they were accompanied by 50 very curious Muslims. Not surprisingly, okay? They arrived at the Christian hospital in the big city, and there the doctors examined Rina. And the second miracle, the cancer is gone. There is no trace of cancer in her body. The cancer that killed her is gone. So two huge miracles. Not only the cancer is gone, but she has been raised back to life. So the doctors don't need to do anything except they gave her some intravenous fluids because she had had no fluids for 10 days when she was dying. So they kept her overnight and gave her some IV intravenous fluids. The next day she goes home. Today she is healthy as ever. There she is testifying what God did for her. Okay. And the one who raised her back to life is a man named Elijah, whom we trained in the use of authority. And, and you know what Elijah says? He says, the key in reaching these people, what is the tip of the spear to reach, to penetrate the spiritual darkness? It is authority. That's the tip of the spirit that allows you to penetrate the extreme darkness of Islam.
miracles authority. Okay? Without the authority, your spirit is blunt and cannot penetrate it. But with the miracles, ah, it's like the tip of a sharp spear. It penetrates. And after it penetrates, yeah, after the miracles, then you need to contextualize the gospel. Are you familiar with contextualizing the gospel? I guess not, right? I don't think so. What does, let me just share with you very, very briefly, okay? When you share the gospel with Muslims, you have to understand that Muslims are indoctrinated against Christianity, okay? So right off the bat, we are at a disadvantage. They are told that Jesus is not the Son of God. Okay? Your Bible is corrupted. Okay? They have been indoctrinated against Christianity. So, when you share the Gospel with a Muslim, you do not mention anything about Christianity. Don't mention the word Christian or church or conversion. Just talk about Isa. Now, I know there are a lot of nuances and shades to this, which you know much better than I do, but Isa is a prophet, and they believe in Isa as a prophet, correct? So build a bridge to them. Instead of saying the word Jesus, talk about Isa. They believe that Isa heals, and we believe Isa heals, and we know how to heal in the name of Isa. And so you can use that. When you're, see, some of you may have a boss who is a Muslim, right? And if you have a boss who is a Muslim, I'm sure some of you do, okay? And so one day your boss might get sick. Well, what are you going to do when your boss gets sick? You're going to go up to her and him, and, and you might ask something like, uh, would you like Isa to heal you? And of course he or she will say, of course, I believe Isa heals. Even though they've never seen Isa heal, but they believe that Isa heals. So what do you do? You lay hands on them in the name of Isa, and you exercise authority. And let me tell you, God heals Muslims very, very quickly, faster than he heals Christians. Do you know why? Because Christians are already saved. They don't need to be healed. They're already saved. That's the most important thing. But for a Muslim to be saved, they need to see the miracle. So that's why God heals Muslims much faster than he heals Christians. So you heal them in the name of Isa, and they will be healed. And then gradually, gradually, you can share with them who Isa really is. He's not just a prophet, he is the Messiah. Okay? Now I'm sure our brother here has a lot more to share with you about that, but these are just the general outlines of how to share the gospel with the Muslim. And uh, so you, they, they do not convert to Christianity? No, 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 no. As long as they have Jesus in their hearts as Lord and Savior, they are saved, right? Did Jesus ever say that you have to convert to Christianity to be saved? No. Did he ever say you have to be a Christian to be saved? No. So it's not about converting to Christianity or even becoming a Christian. It's about following Isa as Lord and Savior. So they can be saved without converting to Christianity. Should you immediately bring them to church? No. Once they go to church, then their community knows that they have betrayed the faith and the persecution begins against them. So let them remain underground, underground, underground. They are not Christians, they are born again Muslim followers of Isa. And you can disciple them in the privacy of their home. Okay? So it must remain underground. Okay? Don't take them to church. Disciple them in the home. You got that? Well, these are just some outlines, some guidelines for you to reach Muslims here in Bahrain. Okay? But the tip of the spear is the authority. The authority. The miracles. Okay? Are you going to reach out to your boss? Yes? Yeah. If they're sick, do they want to be healed? Of course! Of course. So heal them. Love them, heal them, submit to them, <coughs> and lead them to Isa. You got that? Okay? That's contextualization. Right? 
there is Elisha on your right. And on the left, on the left, is a feared Sunda leader whom they used to call devil. Okay? He looks like that, actually. He looks like he's a terrorist from ISIS, doesn't he? When, uh, when we first saw him, I thought, well, when my wife saw him come into the room, she said, uh-oh, we're in trouble. He's going to kill us all. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> he looks like some radical terrorist. He's going to kill us all. But it turns out, he's a born-again follower of Jesus Christ, okay? On the right is Pastor Elijah, who trained with us and who led devil to Christ. All right. So, when they accept Christ, do they have to dress like a Christian now? Do they have to dress like a Westerner, wear a, a suit and a tie? Do they have to do that? No, 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 no. They remain as they are. Because if they remain as they are, they can witness to other Muslims. They stay underground, they still look like Muslims, but they're born again in their hearts, so they can continue to be witnesses to their own people. Do not take them out of their people group. Let them remain in their community as Muslims, so they can witness to other Muslims. And you teach them how to heal the sick and cast out demons, okay? They'll be very excited when you teach them how to perform these miracles and then they will reach out to their family in the same way, okay? So, the dress, the appearance stays the same, okay? No ties, none of that stuff, okay? Let them remain just as they are. The key thing is the heart is born again. They have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior. Okay, there is... There is Rina and her father, and her sister. And about a year later, after she was raised back to life, one day when the family left the house, when they came back, this is what they found. One of their neighbors, who was very angry, came and burnt their house down to the ground. So of course, as you know, there is a price to pay for following Jesus Christ. They lost their home. We sent some money over there to help them rebuild the home. Now Rina has started her life, her new life, born again follower of Isa, and I believe she is now a uh, cosmetician. Okay. All right. How about Paul? Let's look at Paul for a moment. How did Paul minister to the sick? Paul was not one of the original 12 disciples, so he was not there when Jesus gave power and authority to the 12 and sent them out. He wasn't present, okay? He wasn't trained by Jesus. So how did Paul minister to the sick? Let's find out. This is interesting. Acts 28, verse 7. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. His father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him and after prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. How did Paul heal this man? What did he use? Uh, was it the prayer that resulted in the miracle? No. What did Paul do after prayer? Power. He laid hands on him and healed him. Okay. So Paul, even though he was not trained by Jesus, at least in the flesh, he's using power. He laid hands on this man and healed him. Did Paul mix the praying and the laying on of hands? Did he mix the two? No, he kept them separate. After prayer, placed his hands on him and healed him. Okay. No mixing. No mixing. You want to pray? You pray first. But after that, then you authority or power. No mixing. Here's another miracle, Acts 14, 8. In Lystra, there sat a man who was lame. He had been that way from birth and had never walked. 
He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed, and called out, Stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. Okay, how did Paul do this? Did he use authority or power or both? He just used authority. He gave a command to this lame man, Stand up on your feet. And the man jumped up and began to walk. In this case, I believe that Paul may have received a word of knowledge from the Holy Spirit. I believe the Holy Spirit told him that that man had faith to be healed. Okay? After receiving that word of knowledge, then Paul acted by giving a command. Okay? That's what I have concluded. Paul looked at him and somehow Paul knew that he had faith to be healed. Maybe that was the word of knowledge from the Holy Spirit. But what did Paul do after receiving the word of knowledge? Did he just stand there and wait for God to do the healing? No. What did he do? Authority. Stand up on your feet. Okay. So, giftings can be good, a word of knowledge can be fine, but after you receive the word of knowledge, then you need to give the command for the miracle to take place. Okay. How about Philip the Evangelist? How did Philip perform these miracles? Acts 8 verse 5. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. So. Philip was performing the signs. So does it seem like he was praying to God in the traditional way? No. God was using Philip to perform the miracles. So I believe he was using authority and perhaps power as well. So he was not just praying for the sick and leaving the results up to God. God was using him to perform the miracles. Okay. For with streaks, impure spirits came out of many and many who were paralyzed or lame and were healed so there was great joy in that city and as a result of these miracles many people were baptized okay? miracles first and then people putting their faith in Jesus Christ how about drug addicts do you have any drug addicts in Bahrain? Probably not too many. Some? Some drug addicts. Do you know any drug addicts? Okay. How do you minister to a drug addict? Well, drug addiction is a combination of the physical and the demonic. Two components. Drug addiction. There's an unclean spirit and there's a natural physical addiction. And we have authority in both areas of the physical as well as the demonic. So if there's a drug addict who wants to be set free, you can minister to them miraculously. They can be instantly set free from the craving for the drug. But you do both. You lay hands on them in Jesus' name for the release of healing power to heal them from the physical addiction. And then you command the spirit of drug addiction to come out in Jesus' name. You do both, power and authority, and the demon will come out, and the craving, the craving will disappear. Okay. It is possible to set drug addicts free instantly, but the important thing is that they must want to be set free. If they don't want to be set free, don't even try, okay? Because God honors our free will, okay? But if they come to you and say, I want to be set free, please help me, then, you can set them free with power and authority. Just make sure that after they are set free, they must accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If they do not, it may come back, and even, what, seven times worse. Okay? And then teach them what to do if they feel the demon trying to come back. You teach them, you disciple them, you teach them how to use this authority to rebuke the spirit if it ever tries to come back. We have seen even people set free from cigarettes, from nicotine addiction, in the very same way. Okay. Praise the Lord.
not many drug addicts here no, in Bahrain. Not in this country. Only in the Western countries, I guess. No, there are. There are drug, drug addicts here. Oh, okay. Now, let us Let me share this one testimony. This is a testimony of mountain moving faith with persistence. This is the testimony of a pastor named Carl Henderson, whom I trained several years ago. Oh, he's the one who went to the Philippines and he saw 51 house churches planted in less than five months. Remember that testimony I shared? Okay. This is the same servant of God who was a missionary to the Philippines. Now he is back in the United States. Before he went to the Philippines, he went to minister to his mother, who was 84 years old. Let me read to you his testimony. My 84-year-old mother was a bedridden Alzheimer patient. She had not walked in over four months and had not eaten solid food in over a month. The hospice people said she was dying. That's correct, right? There is no cure for Alzheimer's, especially if the patient is elderly. No cure at all, no hope. So we drove a long distance to say our last goodbyes to her. But I came with a plan to use God's authority in the name of Jesus to heal her. Okay? This is a huge mountain. Okay? Elderly people generally more difficult to minister to. After my family sang hymns, ministered to her, and loved on her, they left the room in tears. They said their last goodbyes. There was a dark, palpable spirit of death in the room. I, and that's Carl, he's by himself now, with his mother in the room, I ministered the Elijah Challenge A-bomb to her for over an hour continuously, taking authority many times over her many symptoms, those I could remember or that she could tell me about. So what is this Elijah Challenge A-bomb? I didn't know what it was when I first read his testimony, so I said, Carl, what is this Elijah Challenge A-bomb? And he said, authority bomb. Okay. So he spent one hour laying hands on his mother and giving commands. Everything he could think of. He'd lay hands on her everywhere, on her head, everywhere, and rebuking the spirit of death and rebuking Alzheimer's and everything he could think of. She experienced some gradual improvement in some lesser symptoms. Like headache was gone, blurry vision was getting better, and weakness, she was getting some strength, okay? So gradual improvement during that one hour. I also explained to her God's authority to heal her while I rubbed lotion on her painful feet. I did this to show my love for her and so that she could believe also. She was in and out of consciousness during this time. I continued speaking to her and rebuking the disease. I even rebuked the spirit of death many times. Okay. One hour as perseverance. Many, many times I continued to command healing to her from head to toe. And at the end of an hour, she said she felt tingling and warmth in her legs. What do you think that was? I believe that's the power kicking in, the healing power, dunamis kicking in. At that point, I commanded her to get up and walk in Jesus' name. Because Carl knew that the healing power was now kicking in, so now is the time. Okay, Mom, get up. So he helped her up and he began to walk her around the room. Okay. okay, remember, get up in Jesus' name and walk them around. At first, she walked slowly, but within five minutes, with confidence and without help. She walked into the living room with me holding her hand. She said, I was her date, and continued on to the dining room table where she sat down. She announced, no longer whispering faint words, that she was hungry and wanted to eat real food. She is healed from terminal Alzheimer's. A powerful miracle. There's no cure for Alzheimer's, especially when you're in your 80s. And she was healed. 
my shocked family could not believe what they were seeing. Imagine an hour earlier they were saying their last goodbye. <coughs> now she walks out and says, I want some real food. Can you imagine how shocked they were? My mother's face was even glowing and had color. The deathly pallor was gone. Her voice was strong. My sister, who was her caretaker, said, what did you do? I told her God healed her. They made her dinner and she ate heartily and she followed it up with a big piece of pie. She walked, she then walked to a chair in the living room and sat down with my three-year-old son, her grandson. They sat together, talked and watched TV. He was meeting her for the first time. After an hour, she announced she was tired and wanted to go back to bed. We helped her from the chair and she walked back to bed for a nap. The next day, she was still walking around the house and eating by herself. She was actually getting into the refrigerator and frustrating my poor sister. She is elderly, okay, and you understand elderly people. Okay. When we left for our long drive home, she wanted to come out on the porch to see us off. We hugged her and left her standing at the door as we drove away. That was four years ago. She went from her deathbed to a nuisance <laughs> in about an hour because of the Elijah challenge, a bomb. Okay. My sister now tells me that at 89 years old, now she is going downhill again with Alzheimer's disease and is more in bed than out. However, she already has had four more years of life because of the authority and power of the name of Jesus. She says now she is tired and is ready to go home to the Lord. God gave her four more years of quality life. Praise the Lord. Carl had to minister for one hour, laying hands on her and exercising authority. Long story made short, don't give up. No one in my family believed after we viewed her terrible condition that she would live, let alone be healed. She was obviously dying. In fact, it was hard to keep from weeping at the sight of her. I still hoped and believed she could be healed. Someone who believes with mountain-moving faith is more than enough for God. It took some perseverance, but our God was and is faithful. Who has mountain-moving faith? Uh, you have and also perseverance. Amen. Perseverance. Now, let's see. I want to teach from James chapter 5. Oh, here's broader authority in the context of preaching the gospel, meaning authority which is broader than simply authority over diseases and demons. We're going to talk about even broader authority. Okay. Our authority in the context of proclaiming the kingdom of God is not simply over disease and demons, but may extend to other matters as well. For example, over the weather, when we are preaching the gospel outside. I've already shared that, okay? How did Paul deal with someone who was obstructing the advance of the kingdom of God? Did he just pray to God about the man? Let's see, Acts 13, verse 6. They traveled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and a false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul, an intelligent man, sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. Okay. So here we have an opportunity for the gospel. The head man of the island, Sergius Paulus, he wants to hear the gospel from Paul and Barnabas. And if the head person accepts Christ, that can open the door for others in the island to hear the gospel much more easily. Okay? 
It's like you go into a village, if the village chief accepts Christ, then it's much easier for the rest of the village to accept Christ. That's how it works. So this man, Jerusalem, Sergius Paulus, he sent for Paul and Barnabas because he wanted to hear the gospel. But Eli was the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. Okay, now, there is a problem. They have this wonderful opportunity because the proconsul wants to hear the gospel. And if he accepts the gospel, the door will be open for the gospel to be spread. But this proconsul has an attendant named Elimus, who is a sorcerer, and of course, he doesn't want his boss to believe in Jesus. So he opposed Paul and Barnabas and tried to turn his boss from the faith. Now, what would we normally do in such a situation? Okay, well, our church background would normally have us pray to the Lord about such a situation, right? Pray to God and trust the Lord for the outcome, typically, all right? And some of us might even ask God to bless and save him, right? You're supposed to bless, love your enemies and stuff like that, right? So we would say, oh God, please bless him and save him, Lord, because we are taught to love our enemies and bless those who curse us, okay? The typical action that we believers would take. But what did Paul do? Let's see what Paul did. Then Saul, who was called also Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elimus and said, Jesus loves you. Is that what he said? No. God bless you. Is that what he said? No. You are a child of the devil. You're an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. You're going to go blind, and for a time, you'll be unable to see the light of the sun. Whoa. Paul cursed him. Paul cursed him. You're going to go blind. You're a child of the devil. You're an enemy of everything that is right. You're going to go blind. Well, good Christians are not supposed to do that, right? No, 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 no. Love our enemies and bless them, right? So what's Paul doing here? Was this action from Paul's carnal anger or from the Holy Spirit? It was from the Holy Spirit, yes. Paul filled with the Holy Spirit and said, you're a child of the devil, you're going to go blind. How do we reconcile? You see, we're supposed, we're not supposed to curse, right? It's supposed to bless. But Paul cursed him, so how do we reconcile the command not to curse but to bless with Paul's action? How do we reconcile this? Well, let's see. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him, and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. So, what Paul spoke to him, you're going to go blind, came to pass. This sorcerer went blind. So how do we reconcile this with the command to love your enemy? Paul is not loving this man, right? He blinded him. So he's not loving this man. So how do we reconcile what Paul did with the command to love your enemy? Now, for the sake of the kingdom of God, yes, we love our personal enemies. For example, those who are offended by us because we are disciples of Jesus Christ. Okay? Maybe you have someone at work he knows that you're a Christian, and so you are mistreated, okay? Maybe your boss takes advantage of you because you're a Christian, okay? And, and that happens. Now, if, you, uh, if your boss persecutes you, it's just very hypothetical, should you still uh, obey your boss? Yes or no? Yes or no? Yes. Should you still pray for your boss? Yes or no? Yes. Should you still bless your boss? Yes or no? Yes. Yes, 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 yes. Was Elimus a personal enemy of Paul? No. Elimus was a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. He 
he was sent by the devil to stop the advance of the kingdom of God on that island. Now that is serious because it's about the advance of the gospel. That is serious. Elimus was an enemy of everything that is right, an enemy of God sent to stop the advance of his kingdom on that island. When the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. When the proconsul saw the miracle, when he saw his, his sorcery go blind, what did he do? He believed. He was amazed at the teaching. And the teaching was not just words, the teaching included the miracle. And so in the context of proclaiming the kingdom of God, Believers may have a measure of authority to remove obstacles as led by the Holy Spirit. You got that? 